homelessness has uh, probably doubled since the time in the, the early 2000s when we thought that there were 3 million people there. I think that there's a lot more people. I would say the number's closer to 6 million. You won't hear that number from anybody else, probably. I lived in Atlanta for three years, and this is what I saw. Two of the officers involved in the incident last night will be terminated immediately. So what I see happening on the streets of Atlanta is not Atlanta. I was homeless. And the lesson I learned inside of being homeless for this about a three year period was to come out of my comfort zone and to be in a discomfort zone to realign myself and my vision. I mean, and it didn't happen overnight. I wasn't just homeless alone, I had um four children and I was pregnant um, with my fifth child. Not working at that time because I was solely dependent on my ex-husband, I um, became homeless. Nobody knew. My family and people that were close to me knew, but I knew I couldn't leave the district. So I had to stay where I was and I had to stay in that extended stay. So I was in the middle of this race. I couldn't get out of it and I wasn't gonna get out of it. So I, I had to run and smile and, and shake hands and kiss babies and do all those things that politicians do. And I was homeless doing it. We need help. We need to speed up the process of finding places to stay. Even though we sign up with them, then they, we never hear nothing sometimes for months. And they be telling us like, let's come up here, do this, do that. And sometimes we never hear nothing back as I am. And we still out here. At about 11 years old, I became homeless. So what happened was um, my mom, she was working like two jobs. We lived in low income housing uh, neighborhood. I mean, very, pretty nice for, for what it was. And um, she lost both her jobs. And we've been on the streets for almost two weeks to three weeks now. We've been trying to find a place I get a check every month but I can't find nothing that fits our budget. I got a job off of paying $15 an hour in the cater, starting on money, but I don't have any motor fare to get there. I'm asking people for money for the motor fare. It's only like $4 to get there. But I know they want to give you money because I mean, they think everybody's on drugs, so it's hard to get a job. So every time you come by, you might see everybody standing in front of the gateway because you can't go nowhere. The city needs to step their game up for the homeless. Because we done been out here too long, but you put the police officers on us to harass us, that's not good. It's not good. So how did we get here? The International Olympic Committee is awarded the 1996 Olympic Games to the city of Atlanta.
1996, we were uh, the proud host of the Olympics where people from all over the globe uh, converged on Atlanta, said to see one of the biggest sports events uh, ever. And uh, it was such an honor to uh, be in Atlanta in 1996 um, and participate the way that I did in the Olympics. Now you need to understand I was much younger then, I was relatively new to ministry and outreach and I wanted to get engaged in any way possible. I was fresh, I was young, I was energetic, and I really wanted to help people. Well, surprise, surprise, surprise. I was absolutely amazed at the treatment of homeless that were literally pushed out of the city. Shamefully, uh, in my opinion, Atlanta knocked down a bunch of public housing. They told people, here's a Section 8 voucher, go find some place to live, not here. and. Fulton County established a, a grant fund to buy bus tickets for people who were experiencing homelessness. Here's a bus ticket, go somewhere else, promise never to come back. That was controversial even in the moment. And that sort of hung like a specter over the head of the city and the community here, like that this is how you would handle homelessness. We got 9,000 arrest citations. And what they were was pre-printed African-American male homeless to lock people up the 18 months leading up to the games. So that starting in 95, 94 maybe, they began to really round people up and arrest them a lot. By the time the Olympics came, they had passed an ordinance that said if you arrested more than, it was perpetual arrests, you could be kept in jail for six months. It became a felony. The private prison industrial complex is anathema to freedom, to civil rights, to human rights, because private prisons have to be 95% occupied in order to be profitable. Now, how do you do that? How do you ensure that? You keep people homeless so they have to pee in public because there are no toilets that they can get. You can't find a place to use the bathroom. Everywhere you go, no. You, you get tired, you know, I'm 68 years old, I had a heart attack, and I had, and the doctors had told me I shouldn't have made it. And sometimes I get tired and they say, no, you can't sit here. You aren't buying anything, you can't even get a glass of water. And it, it's, especially on weekends. I even bought into Grady Hospital, that is my hospital. Well, if you don't have an appointment here, and I say, you know, you got to get out. I said, sir, I didn't want to use the bathroom. You got to get out. I mean, you know, of course, if you go out on the street and they catch you, you get in trouble for that. They have to eat in public. Sometimes that's against the law. One of our members shouted at him, why can't we do a free meal for the homeless without state harassment? Why, why, why? And he arrested her for that. So now there's a lawsuit pending against the city uh, for that false arrest. Um, and hopefully she'll be able to get some justice for that. They have to sleep in public. That's certainly against many laws. You have, they have to sometimes beg or ask for help in public. That's been criminalized. Every behavior that we all engage in, that we are free to engage in, has been criminalized for people who have to live outside or on the streets here. And so they are easy prey. You criminalize their natural behavior, their normal, required, life necessary behavior. And then they fill up the prisons. We had to go all the way to Boston to find a very conservative constitutional law firm to bring the case against the city the mayor and the city on behalf of homeless people because nobody locally wanted to stir anything up. They wanted to be on board with the Olympics because it was going to reframe, redo Atlanta, which it did dramatically. Breaking news. Congratulations, Super Bowl 53 will be played in Atlanta. Congratulations, Dorothy.
Atlanta is ready to showcase its beauty and hospitality once again. We know how to plan for a party this size after hosting an Olympics in 96 and Super Bowls in 94 and 2000. Everybody wants to see the Super Bowl, but it's just one game. I've had officers in the past week straight up tell me that, 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 that their orders are to any, anybody they see panhandle or anything to lock them up until after the Super Bowl's over. We have a bunch of people that's collaborating and conspiring to lie about what's actually happening during this Super Bowl. The Super Bowl kicked in money. They put up $50,000 to go and help establish, you know, a diversion center here. PAD actually began in 2017. So uh, city council, uh, activists, members of the community just came together to want an alternative to over-policing in, in Atlanta in our jurisdiction. So um, they wanted to invest in a service that can actually support individuals who are experiencing quality of life issues instead of arresting them. When I'm telling people, don't bust them out, don't break up the encampments, don't jail them, don't arrest them, because you don't have to, because it's really not the kind of thing that creates some huge problem for, for visitors and tourists, that was a much easier sell. My organization, the Southern Center for Human Rights, uh, the pre-arrest diversion folks, we all sort of pow out and said, yeah, we're yeah, it, it didn't happen. Like, we didn't, we didn't try to get rid of them. Everything's okay. Like, we didn't break up encampments so we could still find the people so that we can, we can serve them. And the Super Bowl helped. It didn't hurt. It's been a big conspiracy to, get to, to disappear the homeless once again when a major event comes to Atlanta. You know, I've had policemen tell me, you know, and I'm not going to say their names because I'm glad that they told me that this is what their mandate was to get the streets clear. Tell the folks what happened the next morning after they did the homeless count. The next morning about 8 a.m. we showed up and told everybody they had to get out and they bulldozed, they like literally bulldozed the camp flat, tore down everybody's thing, everybody lost their tents and their sleeping bags and blankets and all, all your belongings, period. Like you had like 10 seconds to grab what you could grab and run off. And, you know, they just, they, they destroyed everything and told us to get, and then they told us if they saw us in the area that we'd be arrested. And what didn't make sense to me is because we've been there for well over a year, out of sight, not causing any problem, yeah, not hurting anybody. And if they want everybody, if they don't want tourists to see us, why are you going to come move us out of where we're hidden and put us out in the wide open? Now we got no choice but to be where the tourists can see us. Yeah. We were hidden where nobody knew where we were. Well, I mean, the police knew who we were, but they didn't mess with us because we weren't doing nothing wrong. All we were yeah. doing was living. Yeah. But now they, they want us out. And they got us out now because it's an empty lot now. They gutted all the bridges where people were staying. I was, I'll be honest, I was staying there too. And they said nobody could have a tent down here anymore. Um, they did petition and put out for some people to, to, to try to get inside. For those that didn't, I've seen some people get arrested. If you're walking around looking homeless with a bunch of bags, they're getting challenged, checked for IDs. It's, it's been a crazy little time. And I understand, you know, if it was my city and the Super Bowl was kind of, I would try to create an image, but it seems to me I've seen a lot of vacant buildings, places where they could actually house some people and, you know what I mean, get them off the streets. So for them to say that BS about they're not arresting folks, that's not, that's not their intent, that we want to help them, we want to help get them housed. How are you going to house the folks in the camps when you can't even house the folks or shelter the people that are sleeping in plain sight? I know that that's bullshit, okay? Because I'm out here every damn night and I see these folks out here on the streets and they are being dehumanized by the police. They're bulldozing the homeless camps. They run folks off. They're taking people's tents and belongings for no other reason than them being out sleeping out in the open where they can be seen. I stood at the table with some of the police officers as they said in advance of the Super Bowl that they would not want to target anyone experiencing homelessness. I stayed on the phone with the Atlanta media team who said that they were going to notify individuals of warming shelters that were open. I even continued to advocate on my own dime for the opening of hotel rooms and Airbnbs for people who were going to experience a push out.
and if we are going to have other major sporting events here in the city of Atlanta, within Fulton County, or even in the state of Georgia, our agencies must coordinate in a more healthy and humane fashion. We funded um, a billionaire's dream, a stadium who, who owns yachts, and who's now been in the paper for being one of the top, you know, wealthy in sports industry, Arthur Blank. Look at the condition of Vine City. You know, we did that. We, we are funding billionaires. We are funding wealthy developers. We are funding LLCs to flip. We are funding wholesalers. We are subsidizing them via the paying for affordable housing that is a minuscule. When our crime goes up and our housing crisis, you know, becomes exacerbated to a homeless crisis. So me, you, these, the regular people are funding this. Gentrification is the only housing policy that this city has. Atlanta's housing policy is gentrification. That's it. The city has actually been contributing to home values or rents going up in various neighborhoods across town. Neighborhoods have been transforming in large part because of the belt line. Old buildings are torn down as new properties go up, changing the demographics of communities. The belt line was afforded off of federal funding specifically for low income status neighborhoods. So what that means is that it was the lower income residents of these communities who afforded that funding to create this, this walkway. And unfortunately, what the walkway did was attract, because of the way the Beltline operated, um, a bunch of people who wanted to live by it that were more affluent and the, and the Beltline did not have a plan for those legacy residents. It caused the displacement. So the very funding that was supposed to aid them actually aided them out of Atlanta. New developments in the Bankhead neighborhood with homes priced at a half a million dollars and they are sparking a lot of talk about the pace of gentrification in Atlanta and how it is at warp factor speed right now. The 1029 West development being constructed on Donnelly Hollowell Parkway in Bankhead is going for about $500,000 per town home. The developer, Brock Built Homes, is building 61 units right near where Microsoft is expanding and building a 90-acre new business campus. All of this in a neighborhood where the median household income is about $37,000 according to the census. Zoning regulations are the first obstacle that cities can invest in to segregate housing and keep poor people out and poor housing out and it's just the first step in gentrification and the easiest to use. They can't think outside the box around maybe we should have a moratorium on, on building downtown more luxury apartments, right? Maybe instead the city should issue some bonds and build low to moderate income housing and get a smaller return, right? There's nothing wrong with that happening. There's nothing wrong with taking property that the city already owns and putting money into those, those, um, those properties so that they can either be given to homeless folks to live in or sold at a below market rate and put in land trust so you don't have to worry about the value of the property rising exponentially and forcing people out. We are at the new entrance to the new West Side Park. Um, it will be when it opens the largest park in Atlanta. It's a joint project between the city, the, our parks department, our watershed management department, the nonprofit community. Um, there's an old quarry inside this park that will grow Atlanta's water supply from three days to 30 days in the event of an emergency. Um, it's a 300, 350 million dollar project that's been years in the making. West Side Park is now officially open. We're told the park will include 280 acres of green space and miles of trails. But one of the things we've learned is that when you announce you're building Atlanta's largest park, um, the neighborhoods around that piece of property start to see a lot of changes very quickly um, in the form of developers coming in or investors coming in and buying up 
either single family homes or large pieces of land. Um, what was originally going to be a project called Quarry Yards has now been purchased by Microsoft. Microsoft unveiled plans that they believe will make Atlanta one of the largest hubs for Microsoft here in the U.S. Not too far outside the entrance of this park, you'll reach um, an elementary school that serves this area that's 95% students who qualify for free or reduced lunch and 99% students of color. Um, and just down the street are homes that are selling for four, five, six hundred thousand dollars now. Um, and so the west side has seen a tremendous amount of change that the money that the, that the city is putting into this project is drastically raising home values in surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and amenities like this are great. And the folks who've lived in Grove Park for 20 or 30 or 40 years deserve to live near a great park. They also deserve to be able to stay in their home. Even with folks in the community who think that if they get to sell their home for a higher price that they somehow made it now. But unfortunately, even when they get to sell their homes, they can't afford to continue to live in Atlanta. It's not like they get to live further in town. They have to move out, out of town, right? And so that means public transportation is less. That means it's a longer drive, so that's more money for gas, there's less social services, jobs are not as plentiful. So there's a lot of disadvantages that come with selling your home when you're living in Atlanta and being forced to move outside of it. There's 30 million vacant homes and a lot of them are ghost homes. No one's gonna live there. They weren't bought for that purpose. They were bought for the purpose of having a solid investment opportunity. So you're driving up the cost of housing, you're gentrifying communities, and you're doing it at a time where housing is sitting vacant while families are living in the goddamn street, sleeping in their vehicles, hiding from the cops. Gentrification is, is a major problem. You know, with all the programs you've had over the last 20, 30 years, you've gotten black people out of the cities and white people are moving back. And they moved out to get away from black people and now they're moving, getting rid of black people and moving back in, gentrifying the city. Um, in some senses, Truly Living Well has been a part of that gentrification process, um, but this land is owned and anchored by black people. All right, so we can reach out to black folks. It's going to remain that way. I think that's an important characteristic of the, of the work that we have done. You know, the whole really get into the politics of this thing. I think that the civil rights movement disintegrated the black community. Uh, we used to do business with each other. We used to have uh, live right next door to the doctors, live next door to the janitor, the mechanic, to the banker, all right there in the same community. You bought food from a black grocer, dry cleaner, you know, your dentist, everything was right there. But now those folks have moved out and what you've left in the city is what we used to call a lumpen proletariat. Okay? Uh, these are the very poorest of the poor, the ones that have been uneducated. The schools are still a mess. Uh, they have become resegregated, and that's a problem. Um, so how, how is that dealt with? Uh, gentrification is, 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 is created, making that pro problem even greater than it had been. And some of these things that I'm saying now, there's a lot of my associates would not appreciate the fact because they've been able to move up. They have nice homes and nice neighborhoods. Um, but they, we, we tend to forget those who have been left behind. And I think that's so important. Chain is no stronger than its weakest link, and, and we are our brother's keeper, and we need to, to maintain that. Right now in the Atlanta metro area, we need over 100,000 more affordable housing units, and we will need 10,000 more every single year for the next 10 years for us to even barely address our issue. That is us looking at those who are on the brink of homelessness. These are mothers who are making $10 an hour and are working at a job and trying to get their kids to and from extracurricular activities, but are having to stay in hotels and motels because they can't provide three months in advance rent. If we're looking at temporary housing and emergency housing, those numbers are astronomical as well. If we're looking at supportive housing, those numbers we need as well. So in all of our housing market, we are at a deficit in the city of Atlanta and in the state of Georgia. It is really a lot of running around being homeless, a lot of going here and going there and nobody having up-to-date information and nobody having accurate information and just being run in circles. And it's pretty much a, a game of luck. I'm at the Atlanta Mission, down near the World Coast. 
and you have to be out by uh, 6:30 if you're st um, if you're staying there, you can stay, but then you got to sit there sit there all day. If you go leaving, you got to leave by 6:30, and you can't be back until about 3:30, or no later than 5:30. It was suggested to me by someone. <laughs> they're gonna remain nameless. You should go live in a shelter, and I was like. Then I mentioned it to someone else that maybe that is what I should do. And they said, no, not you. Do not go in the shelter. Let me tell you what happens in the shelter. You get your stuff stole. It's like jail. This mandated structure thing, you know, just it sucks the life out of creativity. I stood in line and waited to see what was going on. I got this major thought hit me. This is not where you need to be. I got out of the line and I kept it moving. The concept of shelters is as old as the concept of crises and emergencies, right? Like even with homelessness in the early 80s, the first homeless shelters were funded by FEMA. Before, the, before HUD started funding homeless programs, which I think is incredibly ironic since they created homelessness by cutting housing programs. But before HUD tried to turn the shelters into, this is where we're gonna fix everybody. They were just, and this is when I was living there, they were funded by FEMA as temporary emergency facilities. So the idea that this is a crisis, this is temporary, we need to get people off the street and get them a, a, into a shelter. That concept's been around forever where the shelter system has totally fallen on its ass is 37 years later. I mean, you know, if you're looking at, you know, a flood in Tennessee or, some, or, or Louisiana, 37 years later, those FEMA shelters are still there. You would say that was incompetent. We didn't respond to the crisis. We didn't rebuild what was destroyed in the flood. So that's homelessness. And that's why, and as the shelters have stayed ingrained as basically a new tier of housing, of congregant housing, the restrictions placed on what time you need to be there, when you get up, how you conduct yourself. Uh, there's one shelter here, four o'clock in the afternoon till six o'clock because the people are going home from work and walking to the subway. And we don't want you out front in front of the shelter. So from four to 6 p.m. you have to be inside so no one sees you and you have to be up at 7 a.m. and leave. That makes no sense. specific requirements that kept people out of shelters and looking for the, just the right fit were ID first, that was one. Being, being tested, um, having vaccines now can keep people out of shelters and we're advocating so clearly that no one should be kept away from a shelter because he or she isn't vaccinated. There are other shelters where you have to go to church and be willing to go to church, even if you have to um, quit your job or get a different schedule for your job because you might miss church. So those requirements are very restrictive. So there's a lot of shelters that are just really, really um, brutal, disgusting, if you will, uh, when it comes to hygiene. Atlanta Baptist, Rescue Mission, and Atlanta Mission, they got them. Majorly, I had got bit in the eye, and my whole eye, like somebody hit me, it, it was a vet bug. There are other requirements that, that, that you be the person you are on your ID, which means if you're transitioning or have transitioned and your ID doesn't respond to that or doesn't reflect that, then you have to be who you were or are or were on your ID to get in. So if you have a family, many times it's a, 
a men's only shelter or a women's only shelter, or you have to have a marriage license. Uh, so uh, the, the family gets broken up by the shelter system. It cannot be a recycling occurrence that someone has that says, okay, you can't be out past five o'clock, but your job states that you be out past eight o'clock. So that means you cannot work. So if you cannot work, if you cannot sleep, you cannot work. So I go to my job, I'm tired, I'm lazy. So the management gonna think I'm on drugs or you in a shelter. That's why a lot of companies don't hire people. Everybody needs a place to go. So the, the issue is entry should be without obstacles and then distribution or accessing where you need to be permanently should be the next step. There are several shelters in Atlanta that are government run and privately owned. I reached out to several of them for an interview, but haven't received a response. But I did speak with one shelter called Gateway Center, which was formerly the Fulton County Jail. It now provides various services for everyone, but only shelters men. As we currently exist, we are um, still considered sort of a triage center, sort of a doorway or a gateway to services. We provide coordinated entry or clear path assessments for any person, male, female, trans, non-binary, mothers and children, fathers and children, same-sex couples, whosoever, anybody, Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. That's what they're doing with these coordinated intakes. People can't even go to a shelter to ask for help. They have to wait till Monday at nine o'clock or get an appointment and get screened and go to a single point of intake because that makes it easy. People don't have to remember where you where to go. How stupid do you think we are? In Atlanta, the hierarchy for accessing homelessness resources is the continuum of care in Atlanta. United Way goes along to get along. I mean, they're the business community at giving. They designate, they have designated giving to designated entities, and you have to be approved to get into their, onto their list. So um, they're sort of a junior partner, and they're nationwide. So uh, the continuum of care is pretty powerful in this area. I'm learning the terminology that I need to use when I go and I take, you know, give my information and I'm telling them my situation. You know, there's certain terms that you need to use that will qualify you to be a priority candidate for housing. I went down to Gateway. They ended up sending me down to Atlanta Mission. And Atlanta Mission sent me down to, well, they wouldn't take me there because they said I had a felony charge. So they were like, we won't accept you. Then they sent me down to Calvary, which was an emergency shelter for a couple of weeks. And I stayed there. And then when that time was up, because you only get three weeks there, and it's just a nighttime shelter, basically. You have to be out between 5.45 in the morning and 5.45 in the evening every day. So that's also kind of hard because you're out there at the, you know, it's not even the track of dawn yet. And then finally, um, I think another girl who had gotten accepted into uh, the Atlanta Day Shelter, who also had felonies, they told her she was fine. But um, she was like, you should check out this place called Solomon's Temple. You know, she was like, they're cool there. And you, um, and you know, all you do is you just give them some of your food stamps and, you know, you get to go there and you get to stay for six months. And I was like, mm. But, uh, you know, I was getting to the point where it was like, okay, well, I need to get in somewhere because we had been out of the emergency shelter for about three or four days by then, and we were staying in the hotel. So, uh, you know, I, of course, I called down here. I spoke with Miss Keisha, I believe. And um, I want to say like maybe a day or two later, she called me back and, and they accepted me in here. She just listed four different shelters. Pay attention on how the process works. When you first start, you know, you go in for an intake. Everybody's doing assessments and intakes for you. <laughs> and they're keeping up all this information. And, you know, over the time, you're going back to them and you're updating them on your status and things like that. Hopefully you found housing or, you know, whatever it is that you needed. But a lot of times you haven't. Or, you know, a lot of places don't want to help you unless you have AIDS or you are, um, you have a mental, mental illness or, you know, you are basically on drugs or you are prostituting or you know the ex the circumstances are so extreme but it's almost like do I have to do these things to get help <laughs> that makes no sense <laughs> the thing about Solomon's Temple is that it's a um, it is a transitional shelter
when you go into a transitional shelter, it voids you for all of your homeless benefits because they consider you to not be homeless anymore. Solomon's Temple being a transitional shelter breaks up that stint of homelessness. So of course, and, and they want you to be chronically homeless, which that's what the chronically homeless means, is that you've been homeless for a year over the last three years. So I had to wait longer, and I think they just qualified me as being chronically homeless because they had to wait more time until um, between my last, uh, you know, basically my year and a half because I was here for six months. But I think the, the worst part about it is that these programs, they tell you, okay, come down here. They give you all these um, requirements for their program or whatever. They disqualify you on the smallest things. And then once you get down there, though, they all want to tell you, oh, go back to United Way, go back to Gateway. But Gateway and all these places are just going to send you back to these other places. But these places want a, not a referral, they want a sponsorship from Gateway. So why are you sending me to all these places if I cannot actually get into them without you saying so? Me calling them and me going down there doesn't help me. Why am I getting this information if it doesn't help me? The restrictions are um, worsening rather than relaxing. And there's no, um, there's no emergency shelter without obstacles available right now in Atlanta, Georgia. I think it's issue of the number of low barrier because not everybody's going to want to go into a program that has a, an authoritarian basis. It's like, do this, do that. This is when you get up. This is when you pee. This is, you know, this is everything. And there needs to be some more low barrier options. Peachtree Pine Shelter was a low barrier shelter on the corner of Peachtree and Pine Street that accepted anyone without restrictions or requirements, as mentioned earlier. It could house up to a thousand people per night and was open 24-7. But the issue was that it was located a few blocks from the Emory Hospital, the famous Fox Theater, and other local attractions. Business owners and other officials weren't excited about seeing America's poor roam the streets of this populous and economically developing area. So what happened to the Peachtree Pine Shelter? In 1996, when we discovered that the city had hidden homeless people in the basement of Peachtree Pine, the Peachtree Pine building, we said, aha! Aha, how could they object to our designating that building in this plan that we had written the big $12.5 million grant to HUD and gotten funded in 95, 96 Olympics were coming. So we were in the process of acquiring that property. And right after the Olympics, that was when we went to St. Luke's and said, you know, will you sell it to us? Peachtree Pine was meant to be the sort of proving ground for what we could do to redevelop a building like that, which was called a tank by an, uh, an engineering professional who came to look at the building to tell us how many stories we could go up. And it was 11. So I can remember having a meeting with Mayor um, Campbell. He kind of, he lost it a little bit in the meeting. Um, because we, he brought together a whole lot of people who were objecting to the fact that we had gotten that building. And what were we going to do? The task force for the homeless owns Peachtree Pine. What are you going to do with it? Well, we said, y'all haven't been doing overflow shelter the way you used to in former mayor's terms. So we will use it however we need to while we plan for its overall redevelopment, which will include housing, mixed use housing, affordable housing, um, transitional housing, emergency shelter. And here would be this project owned and operated by people who had been homeless and were no longer, and others who wanted to come in and integrate that because we wanted to be inclusive. So we, want, we had artists involved. We had an organic garden on the roof. We really had it. And the residents worked that garden. We had rabbits and bees and um, we had all kinds of things. We had the art studio in the front. We were gonna put a coffee shop in the front and the kitchen, we had plans and, and we had had funding for the soup kitchen, but the city um, took that away. The biggest homeless shelter in Atlanta. 
More people died right here. More people got left behind right here. But this is where I got my best work done at. Right here. Peace Tree and Pine. 500 homeless people lived here. They shut it down. After years of litigation and negotiation, there is now a deal to shut down the Peachtree Pine Street homeless shelter. They are closing it down. It's for real. Sold out, whatever it is. But nevertheless, three months, everybody got to go. Emory was very much behind all of the illegal activity that went on beginning in the middle 2000s that culminated in the lawsuit we began to file in 2010. Cutting off the water of the biggest shelter in the southeast um, because we owed a huge water bill that we couldn't afford to pay because they cut all our money. I'm a resident volunteer and I live here in the shelter. We don't have no water. We don't have any water. So without the water, I don't have no water to drink, take a bath, use the bathroom. Nothing. No water at all. They turned it off. And without the water, you know, if you, you got to use the bathroom before you get here. Because if they catch you on the street, you're going to go to jail. We are trying really hard to get, as I said, to get some big water resources here. So all I can say is we're working as hard as we can. And the, and the, the county, while they are strictly enforcing the law and will, they are trying to help us. The legal team that we had accrued to ourselves was wonderful for about eight of those 10 years and were fearless and winning as far as I'm concerned. As far as much of the, of the documentation would prove, we have depositions that should be public and the story has to be told because it's a story of power run amok. Absolute power in this city, controlled by people with a lot of money. And you can read Emory, Coca-Cola, SunTrust, and their water carriers at Central Atlanta Progress. And that was the world we were in for 20 years. And we made it for 20 years. And I've decided I have to celebrate that rather than grieve the fact that we lost. I was part of the group that helped shut down Peachtree and Pine. I was a council member for 20 years before I became president. Peachtree and Pine has always been an, an issue that's come up before council. And there's always been different uh, efforts to try to close it down. Uh, finally, in the last administration, it was a uh, legislation that was passed by the council. I did not support it personally. To to hasten its closing down. Uh, the reason I didn't support it is because I said, I understand the issues the community has and other issues with the way that the shelter is being run, but we need to put them out of business, not get rid of the shelter. And I also warned that if we just did that without having a good plan in place, that we were gonna find more people on our streets. And that's one thing that I think that we see. Peachtree and Pine served a need for uh, people who had nowhere else to go. It was the place of last resort for many people. Many of the other facilities have criteria that you have to meet at, to be able to get in them. Peachtree and Pine took whomever uh, came to their doors and needed shelter from the weather, the cold, etc. So what happened was it was closed uh, and uh, there was no plan in place. There was verbal talk of the plan and planning and how these uh, beds were going to be absorbed through existing providers. But as we've seen, that has not actually worked out. When we took over, there were about 330 people we found, like on the day, like there were about 330 people who were there. Of the 330, maybe 50 or so self-resolved, which is to say they found housing on their own before we could give it to them. The rest we housed, and almost all of them were eligible for one voucher or another somewhere. Permanently supportive housing. Housing until you don't want it anymore. You know, and then there are the people who say, well, we placed them somewhere. There were people who say, well, we got them, you know, onto the voucher program. So we also know by doing work with the um, homeless community and those who receive vouchers, um, there are a lot of people who live in extended stay motels and they have a voucher for the city of Atlanta, but because they don't have 
a place to actually um, use the voucher, they're still homeless. They're just in a different location because it doesn't belong to them. And so that's kind of problematic to me, especially, like I say, in a big city like Atlanta, you would think that we would be opening up, up other facilities. I find it almost 99% completely accurate. There's no way the people at Peachtree and Pine were all placed because whenever I drive down there, there's homeless people all around that building. There's about 16 people sleeping on the church steps next across the street from the same location. So that, that just, that's just false. It was closed down in 2017 and it is empty to this day and people are dying on the streets and have died every year since 2017, and that building is empty, empty. The lack of Peachtree Pine has caused deaths on the street, there is no question about it. And we could go back and look at how many people who were on that list of people who died had been at Peachtree Pine in the past. The system that has been created, called the continuum of care, has been less than helpful and, and harmful in many ways, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of the, the warming centers that were not open enough and certainly not open 24-7 much of the time. We are a warming shelter, so we're a, are a warming refuge is what we're called. So whenever the temperature drops below 35 degrees, we basically open up a warming refuge. And we're also one of the stops for when the city activates cold weather shelters. Traditionally, the city only opens those up after it's been several days of cold weather, um, or it's forecasted to be several days. They open the one up that's over the old Adamsville Rec Center, and then there's a facility off of Del Mar in Edgewood that they open up. So we'll be kind of a, um, a transport hub so people can come here and ride the bus. But we'll have about 65 chairs for men to come in from the warming refuge. And then we put down mats for women and children inside of our chapel. The constant life on the street and the stress of it and the exposure even at temperatures as high as 60 degrees, if it's constant, um, damage, damage you emotionally and mentally. So we had psychiatrists from Emory who talked to our coalition. We had psychiatrists and mental health care people and, and Grady doctors and nurses come and talk to us about how often the exposure and the life in shelters imposes all kinds of vulnerabilities on people. And we knew that, but we needed people who would be believed by policymakers. I think there is a correlation between being homeless and being on the street and, and mental health disorders. Um, it it's, would be shocking to think that there wouldn't be. I mean, if you are constantly in a state of fear because you don't know if you're gonna get arrested or you don't know if you're gonna get attacked, that heightened sense of being constantly that fight or flight state, that in and of itself can cause anxiety. Anxiety and depression can be linked together. Not sleeping, you know, is related to a lot of mental health disorders. You could have a genetic load towards um, a psychosis or, you know, a bipolar or something like that. And you've just never had like that second hit that kind of allows the, the genes to express themselves. So maybe you have this genetic vulnerability that this environmental factor has played into. Um, I mean, I think people probably do get into, you know, altercations a lot and they probably do develop acute stress disorder or PTSD. Um, and so, yeah, I think people get hopeless, despondent. I would think, how could you not be depressed if you're on the street as well? Probably at least once a month we get a schizophrenic patient on a medication for schizophrenia that's likely led to or contributed to a metabolic syndrome such as like diabetes, then they get peripheral neuropathy, they get wounds on their feet, they can't feel it, they're on the street, they get an infection, and I'm not kidding when I say probably once a month I have a patient that has maggots in their wounds. And in a way that's disgusting, but it's actually sort of protective because it's actually chewing away the dead tissue and sort of 
what we would call like a debridement. But that's just horrifying that in America, this day and age, you have multiple conditions. So you're schizophrenic on a medication that likely led to your diabetes and you're homeless. So you're in this environment to where you're able to get these infections. Like all of these things should never occur, but we should be able to support them in the appropriate environment. There was a, a shelter, a day shelter, um, Atlanta Union Mission on um, off of Northside Drive. We would go by periodically. My, I myself have been in that shelter. I've been a recipient of a shower. I've been a recipient of, of a meal. And so I know that that was a place where women and children could go early in the morning, um, get something to eat, clean up, um, even talk to a counselor. And so um, when we would go by, if we post, even though we don't put the name of where we are, if certain people can look at it, uh, I'll say law enforcement can look at it, they could say, oh, well, we know what this is. And then you come back in a week later and they have just dismantled the whole place. And the most recent camp that was destroyed was a, uh, women and children sleeping outside of the women's day shelter, just waiting for a chance to get inside and maybe get a bed at the night shelter that only takes people from the day shelter. So you can only be in the day shelter if you're in line to get into the night shelter. But to get into the day shelter, they were spending the night on the street. So their belongings were confiscated yesterday and they were threatened with arrest if they didn't go somewhere else. And dozens of homeless people are told to pack up what little belongings they have and get out. These people ain't got nowhere to go. Once they leave this spot, where are they gonna go? They're gonna go somewhere else and get moved away from that place too. For now, they'd like the city to decriminalize urban housing so these folks don't have to go to jail. And they want the public bathrooms, some of them to stay open 24 seven because right now they open at seven o'clock in the morning and they close by seven o'clock at night. One group facing unique challenges around this outbreak is America's poor. There are growing concerns about how corona could impact soup kitchens, food banks, homeless shelters. Overall, more than 38 million people in the United States are living in poverty, and I promise you, they're not ready for corona. It's hard to follow safer at home orders when you don't have a home. Preventing the spread of COVID-19 among people living outside is particularly hard. With more than 3,200 people suffering from homelessness in Atlanta, figuring out if any of them have the symptoms of coronavirus can be daunting. People that are homeless that are in ARC, you know, you got like 1,500 people that are sleeping side by side, you know. I mean, we don't know what they have. You know, people are constantly coughing and, and all this and that, but what are we supposed to do? Be on the streets, you know, they say stay six, six feet away, but you know, you got all these people inside, we don't know. The coronavirus didn't affect the homeless population in Atlanta as much like medically, like, you know, we're seeing very few cases of people who've tested positive for coronavirus, but what has impacted them is the fact that everything has closed that would normally assist them. So any soup kitchens, any churches, any counseling programs, any housing programs are closed. So um, Atlanta has turned into a ghost town except for homeless people. So it has made it very difficult to move anyone in because most places are not doing move-ins. It's been not impossible to get any documentation or to enroll anyone in health insurance. It's tough. Um, Gateway made a commitment during COVID-19 that we weren't going to close our doors. I can't speak for everyone else, but we believe that it was important uh, and critical that at the time of a pandemic and the lack of resources, as you mentioned, that we remained available. Our homeless do not have access to public bathrooms, those that are in McDonald's, restaurants, or even supermarkets, because they want you to be a paid customer in order to use the restrooms. So, so a lot of times the only facilities that they can use are uh, standing water uh, such as the, uh, the river that I'm standing next to. That becomes their, their washroom facilities. And of course there's, there's trash, there's fecal matter, there's urine, et cetera. There's just as many viruses and bacteria in the water that they're using to wash their hands than you could possibly imagine.
I've seen a lot of people who are eating out of the trash can, and that is a difficult situation where you don't have people who are going to work every day. So they're not throwing anything away. So when they're looking in the trash can, there's nothing there. I've heard stories of people now fighting um, over the trash can food. So we have been trying to go out a couple of times a week to make sure we could do like sack lunches or just water. You know, on a day like this, it's 85 degrees and people, you know, if you're out at two or three o'clock and you haven't had anything to drink, dehydration will set in. So things of that nature, um, I would like to do more of. Uh, we know that it's a need. My workload has skyrocketed since COVID. Before COVID, I think I had 42 clients in the caseload. I now have 96. Um, a lot of that came from when the CDC came to our office uh, uh, recently to do COVID testing. And I made a, a personal decision that I was gonna enroll as many people as I physically could who would come in for testing who, had, who were not attached to case managers already, which was the vast majority of them. Um, a lot of people had touched other outreach agencies, but none of them had case managers. Um, some of them were not in the system at all. Almost all of them had medical conditions that made them, um, the, they were viable for shelter. So these are people often who've been outside for so long. I mean, some people want help. They're good about asking for help, but some people have been outside and independent for so long. They're not very good about asking for free things. Um, so yeah, my caseload has gone up, but I am hopeful that my case will be processed faster because right now we're partnering with Hope Atlanta and these healthy hotels and the public health department to have a sustainable housing solution for a lot of these people that we have enrolled during the pandemic. When you move into the hotel, it's 90 days for free, three meals a day, plus a case manager through Hope Atlanta with the intention of getting you ready for permanent housing after 90 days. So right now they have a list of people that they know they're gonna accept today and the day after tomorrow. But as far as like new referrals, it's kind of like, you don't know how soon that's gonna happen because they only have so many people who are able to work in this hotel. I'm getting off the street, you know, I'm getting a place to stay for 90 days, a nice place to provide a I stayed there before, so I am just elated. I mean, there's, you know, I mean, it's, it's a great hotel, clean. I mean, it's just a one. I, you know, I've been living in the Cab County, you know, at a hotel. I paid up a hotel for a little bit. Um, I do receive disability, um, and I paid up a hotel, but it's very expensive paying a hotel. And I wasn't able because with this coronavirus. I was really ready to get an apartment on my own, but then everything kind of shut down. Nobody's taking applications. And, you know, somebody, I, my car was involved, my parked vehicle was involved in the hit and run. So this is like the one shiny moment since like almost a month ago that is really, you know, just really just, I don't know, it's just a game changer. The CDC has temporarily halted evictions of eligible tenants who can't afford to pay their rent. Tenants who meet specific income requirements have to provide a sworn declaration to their landlord. Once landlords get the declaration, they cannot evict the moratorium while it remains in effect. The CDC's order remains in effect through the end of March. The CDC put a new ban on evictions. Now that ban is set to expire on December 31st. Well, the clock is ticking once again for those who could face eviction this fall. A moratorium on evictions is set to expire in early October or possibly even sooner. Eviction moratorium struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court. Landlords can now start collecting rent again, but millions of Americans can also now potentially be thrown out of their homes in the middle of this pandemic. Now that the eviction moratorium is over, will thousands of Georgians be left homeless? The distribution of rental funds has been slow. The United Way, which handles Atlanta's rental relief program, says because of the high volume, it is currently not able to accept additional applications. Statewide, the U.S. Census says 
a quarter of a million Georgians are facing evictions or foreclosure. On August 26, 2021, the U.S. Supreme Court issued a decision to end the CDC eviction moratorium. So what does that mean for millions of Americans? We had to choose a roof over our head or our transportation. Derek was a quality control inspector for Mercedes-Benz, making $15.50 an hour till he was furloughed in March. I'm between a rock and a hard place. Relying on $216 a week in unemployment. They've fallen $6,500 behind in rent. We're going to be out on the street. Economists are predicting that we could see as much as a 45% increase in homelessness. And I can tell you right now uh, that the homeless community can't absorb a 45% increase uh, with its current funding. The court has started to send out some hearing notices and other paperwork letting tenants know you know, hey, your case will be coming up for a hearing sometime soon. So now that the court is starting to wake up from really this slumber and is starting to send out notices, tenants are realizing that, um, you know, the, the time is, is near when they're going to have to go in front of a judge and, and try to preserve their housing, keep a roof over their head if they can. Uh, so we're getting a lot more calls from people who are saying, help, my landlord has filed this eviction. You know, what am I going to do about it? We need to all come together and use the COVID experience to document our homeless programs don't work. As soon as the cops were taken out of the equation, even though it was only for a month or two before the sweep started up again, as soon as the cops were taken out, the true nature, the true volume of how bad homelessness is in this country exposed itself and came to the front. And then everybody started freaking out and said, oh, but wait, we want to put our restaurant tables outside on the sidewalk, so these people got to go. You know, and it went right back to business as usual. And what I've been pushing with the national groups and stuff is, we need to make sure we don't go back to addressing homelessness the way we were addressing homelessness before COVID. We need to say COVID exposed it for the inadequacy that exists because the one thing our homeless programs don't have is housing. And with long-term subsidies, this housing voucher crap, it's the landlord's choice. It's not a housing choice voucher for the poor person. And they implemented that system when they tore down public housing units with Hope 6 and said, well, we're not going to rebuild the units and the units we do build are going to be mixed income. So these poor people that were living here when we tore the shit down, we're going to give them a voucher and they can go find a landlord that'll take a HUD voucher to house them. Yeah, those vouchers were, t were overwhelmingly turned back in. And of course, it was the poor person's fault. Well, you didn't find a landlord. We gave you a voucher. You know, that voucher should have addressed the racism that exists in this country. That voucher should, you know, the private market's gonna take care of you. Yeah, I mean, I think people, people who claim that, that the reason we are poor is because we don't do enough for ourselves are buying into a white supremacist ideology, right? And they do so because they are also told that if they have a little bit of resources, it's because they earned it on their own or it's because they're special somehow, right? And it's, I, my, my counter argument is you can't be special when you live in a society that for every one of you who thinks that they're making it, there's 15 to 20,000 who have it, right? Any study of any economic system has to show that an economic system has failed when it can't lift up the majority or a critical mass of its poor and working class people to live a sustainable lifestyle. Only in America can you get away with that. I think homelessness and poverty as a whole can be big business. Um, there's a lot of landlords uh, that get um, these subsidies from HUD. Most of them are, well, I shouldn't say most of them, but a lot of them are what you would consider slum landlords. and with permanent supportive housing they get funding for housing for as long as that person stays in the unit 
and they get it at fair market rent, um, which is a little above what the standard rent in the community is. Uh, so that's a big boon for people. I mean, you know, if you have 20 people in your unit, they all get subsidies guaranteed by the government. That is big business. Even agencies themselves, some of the service providers, uh, there's directors of service provide provider organizations that make, uh, you know, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to provide for poor people. To get into supportive housing, you need six forms of identification. You need a birth certificate, a social security card, a state ID, a tuberculosis test result, uh, a HUD McKinney, which is a form saying that you have some kind of a medical condition that makes it difficult for you to find permanent housing, and a wage printout from the Department of Labor. Now, this is specifically for people who've been chronically homeless. You know, you're not gonna be able to get all these six pieces of paper on your own because if you're schizophrenic and you've been on the streets for 20 years, and it's like, okay, we want you to go to these six government agencies where someone's gonna pass you through a medical detector and ask you a bunch of really embarrassing questions about your criminal history and your sexual past. And you're gonna do that over and over again. And even if you have all this documentation and you're motivated and you're coherent and you have a good attitude, um, a lot of my clients are looking at waiting nine months, nine to 12 months just to get into any kind of housing. There is such a backlog in public housing right now. The issue is we need more beds, we need more facilities that we can open up to people. And when you go into the permitting process to do that, what happens is people say, not in my community, not in my neighborhood. So that is another issue. Where will you be able to cite these and who will take them in their communities without opposition? What the city of Atlanta needs is a real meeting with our mayor, with our politicians, with our business owners, and most importantly, the advocates and the actual individuals that we look to serve to hear the foolishness that they have to go through to get their basic needs met. So the best part about these units, and, and it gets me choked up every single time, is each unit has its own address. And when you have an address, you're not homeless. And when you go to register your child for school or when you go to DSS or if you go to wherever, you know, get your driver's license and you put up your address, it doesn't say House of Hope Emergency Shelter. You know, it just says your name and your address. So this is a Mad Hauser's hi-hat. Um, it is meant for one adult. Uh, the floor is about eight foot by eight foot. Uh, total is about 10 feet high. If you go inside, there's a loft space with a ladder. People can either sleep up there or use it as storage. Um, also in the back corner is a wood-burning stove. And here you have a basic uh, locking system so that people can either lock themselves in at night or uh, lock it up when they go to work during the day. This structure right here can go up in a day. If you have four seasoned construction workers who know their way around uh, some power tools, they can put this up in about 12 hours, starting from 
a load of lumber to a completed structure. Uh, we work with kids a lot, so with kids who've never swung a hammer before, it might take them a couple of days, but this really is meant to be built by amateurs. So we partner with church groups, Boy Scout troops all the time. Our blueprints are free to download from the website madhazards.org because we want this to be something that any neighborhood can get together and decide to build on their own. As you can see, we have a van. We call it the TP Love Van. This van was donated by Tyler Perry. Channel 2 News here in Atlanta, WSB TV, they did a special on us about what we're doing in the community in my Honda Civic, 2008 Honda Civic. And it aired and Tyler Perry saw the interview and actually called me. And um, he actually asked me what kind of van I wanted. So this has been a van that I had on my vision board, board for about two years. And um, here we are, and it's just amazing. We have completed and assembled almost 20,000 love bags, which has now put us at 30,000 love bags. Uh, we have been able to stretch our ministry, not just from Sundays. Sometimes we go out and just um, disperse water to uh, people who are on the street. Um, and actually, the good thing about this van, it opens up on both sides. So no matter where I am, if I want to stop and get out and serve, um, that has been one of the beautiful things about it. So when you put things in your head, you know that when it comes together, it just comes together. Our village is a new form of entrepreneurial businesses, uh, housed in shipping containers. It's the first of its kind in the state of Georgia and the city of Atlanta. Our goal was to provide this neighborhood with low-cost office space, to provide uh, new businesses, new ideas, and a new form of business environment. Our overarching vision is that we are able to use this as a model to show the city and become a template for how this can be affordable housing uh, communities, supportive housing communities. This uh, type of community, this village, could eat, it could also be a navigation center for the homeless to be able to prepare them for transition. As you look at each of the areas, each of these could be transitional classes, transitional spaces, learning spaces for the homeless. And so if we could replicate this in other areas and around it build the affordable and supportive housing in underdeveloped areas, areas that have been uh, opportunity zone, but you know, they're demolished and the city has no particular use for them. It does, it's in no one's backyard. We can revitalize the community and have people that are occupying the space in 120, 150 days, which no one else can say that they can do. Instead of vouchers, what we think would make more sense is to give them cards that can be swiped. Uh, they have access entry to, within that space, they'd have a bed, a bathroom, a galley kitchen, and a stackable washer and dryer. Now, we've given them an affordable option to house their family in beautiful communities. What this doesn't show is that we also do exterior cladding so we can create uh, beautiful communities that aren't that don't look like shipping containers that you'd have to be told that they're shipping containers the beauty about this type of housing is that it it can grow vertically this can be built up to nine stories without additional support i find our biggest challenge to be fear when we were trying to create this project it's never been done before uh, there was all of a sudden pushback on, you can't do this, it's never been done, how are we going to accomplish this? This is standing here to show you that it can be done. It can be done quickly. That's the beauty of why this is the perfect solution for supportive housing. So this, this program is, as you see here in Nine Village, can be replicated on any abandoned parking lot. I mean, this is the perfect use for odd areas of the community where we can reach back into our community, reach to those who haven't had a chance to give them an opportunity. The federal government actually is required to make unused property, including buildings and land, available to nonprofits um, working to house and provide services to homeless people for free. Yes, nonprofits can be private nonprofits, they can also be state and local governments. And there are examples, there are over 500 such properties around the country. But, you know, this law has been in place since 1987 and 500 is like a drop in the bucket. There should be a lot more. The federal government owns a lot of property. If you don't think you're entitled to a decent place to live and access to health care and a kick-ass education, then you should get on the sideline and let us do our shit.
because we're coming at this from the perspective of I'm a living, breathing human being. Therefore, I have certain entitlements that come with that. And one of those is I need a place to live. I remember when we were younger, I used to dream of living in mansion. Now reduced to a bitch in the park, cause my circumstances are candid. This the result when you manifested abandonment. I then it is in panic. Damn, it's not how I planned it. Been knocked down a few times. How the hell am I standing? Say they don't understand it, and that part is important. But if you lend me your ear, then I can tell you my story. See, the government won't help us at all. Not that we need them. We would rather they not get involved. Because they like to make laws. Like take my bench in the park. Because they don't want to see me when they take dog for a walk. So they forcing us all under a bridge in the dark. They got us battling demons. They got me fighting my thoughts. We need help. But that don't mean I'm saying we're helpless We need help Cause we know we can't do this by ourselves We need help In the views of society They think I might be A broke man, a lost soul Things aren't as they seem Cause I could be a king A ruler, a peasant, or a god I could be it all